I'll start with a quick summary of what do I mean by, by few shot learning. To try to illustrate this, I use a website Google put together called Teachable Machine, uh, which allows you to use your computer and, and its uh, camera to train visual classifiers. And to try to kind of illustrate the type of uh, applications and, and situations we'd like to enable uh, using few shot learning. And so in this setting, I'm so having fun with my kids building a classifier that's going to discriminate between uh, someone being happy, someone uh, yawning, and uh, someone being scared or acting as if they were scared. Um, and you can see here with my webcam, I collected 9, 12, and 15 examples. And that's not a lot of examples. As you know, in deep learning, our ability to succeed has been mostly based on large availability of data. So in this case, I would like my classifier to also work on my, uh, uh, when it sees my oldest daughter, but in this case, it always says uh, the last class, the orange class. And, but ideally what we'd like is not to have collect data for each single case where uh, it's not working. Uh, so in this case, I'm collecting a few more examples, but even then, like, I'm not even going beyond 30 examples for, for each class. And, uh, and that's obviously a challenge, even though if I explain to you these different expressions, you would probably be able to recognize for a variety of people these three visual concepts. Now, in this case, uh, if, method of work, if a method works well, hopefully by not collecting too much data, then it would start working well, say, if uh, we apply it to uh, pictures of, of her sister here. Uh, this is actually a cherry-picked example. Uh, also, normally, it should be easier than most problems because my two daughters sort of look alike because, you know, they share half my genes, or at least I hope so. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but the reality is that there's a big gap between our ability to understand visual concepts and the ability of deep learning systems to uh, actually be able to understand these concepts. And uh, few shot learning is really about both trying to solve this, I think, very practical application. If it was that easy to create a classifier, a lot of people that don't have machine learning experience and the ability of collecting data could use machine learning. But also there's something deep, I think, that we can learn about what is the difficulty that machines are having in understanding things quickly, whereas we're able to generalize to new tasks from very small amounts of examples. So scientifically speaking, conceptually speaking, the type of problems that we're trying to tackle would look something like this. I'm presented with a new task, and I have a very small training set. This is an example of a one-shot, five-way classification problem in that I have one, do you hear me? Yes? In that I have one uh, example per class for these five classes here. And what I'd like is to get a predictor from the training set here that can uh, provide the right answer for new examples in the test set. And so what we'll do here to try to address this problem in the popular methodology that, that I presented last time I presented uh, is uh, to use meta-learning. And so what we'll do is that we'll actually collect a large set of similar such small shot problem or few shot learning problems uh, corresponding to these uh, grayed out area here where you have here a problem, sorry, I'm having a hard time with my, okay, let me just go back. Yeah, cool. So where, I have, uh, where I'm going to collect what I call a meta training set, I call that a meta training set because it's a set of various sets uh, of various different problems that correspond to different classification problems. Um, the way we usually set up these experiments is that much like any machine learning uh, setting, we'll have a training set and a test set, except in meta learning we have meta training set and a meta test set. And the difference is that the problems in terms of visual classification that I'll use for training will, occur, will be entirely different from those that are used to measure generalization. And the way we do this is we typically take a source data set. So in this uh, picture here, we took a subset of ImageNet where we took 64 classes that we will use for meta training and another set of, I think it's 20 classes for testing. And then to generate these different tasks with small training set, for each case, I'm going to randomly, in this illustration, pick five random classes from the 64 for training. And then for each of these class, I'll draw images from the source data set to uh, construct the training set of the task and the test set of the task. And I'll do that repeatedly to get a bunch of these problems for learning, to learn how to take a training set, produce a predictor, and generalize for that problem. So in the nomenclature of meta-learning, we will call the set dtrain and dtest together for a given task. We'll refer to that as an episode. 
And instead of calling this a training and a test set, it's often more convenient to use other terms than train and test and not confuse them with meta training and meta testing. So I'll say a support set for dtrain. I'll call dtest a query set. And so in meta learning, we want to design a meta learner that can, for each episode, be fed the training set or the support set, I should say. Then the meta learner should produce a predictor, like a convolutional neural net, that can perform this five-way classification problem based on the information in the support set. And then I want to evaluate a loss on the new examples in the query set. Specifically, does it assign high probability to the correct class? And much like we do most of our machine learning, we'll do gradient descent to update the parameters of the meta learner, which you can think of as a learning algorithm. It takes a data set and it produces a predictor. And in meta learning, we're trying to design uh, meta learners such that I can differentiate the loss all the way into the meta learner's parameters. Okay? And so then I would do SGD, or stochastic gradient descent, by iterating on these problems that I'm, that I'm simulating from my source data. And then crucially, I measure the performance on a meta test set that corresponds to entirely different classes. So there's no overlap in the classes used for meta training and for meta testing. Okay? So mathematically speaking, we can think of, this, uh, of, of designing a meta learner as optimizing the following loss. So for a given episode with its support and query set, I want to minimize the cross-entropy of the uh, distribution provided for the label of a query example xi prime, condition on the input, but also condition on the support set, which specifies what is the classification task and how are things labeled for that task. So I want to minimize this and do gradient descent with respect to the parameters of the meta learner. So different meta learners, you can think of it as different ways of parenterizing that distribution here. P of Y, given X where X is a query input, and the support set D train that specifies the task. So um, I'll give two examples of very common uh, meta learners. Uh, the first one, which is quite simple and very effective, is a prototypical network. Uh, you can see the reference here if you want more details. In a nutshell, a, a prototypical network works as follows. It will try to classify a query input by comparing it with prototypes of each class. And the prototype of each class, which are these uh, black dots here, correspond to the average embedding of the images in these class. And the embedding is provided by this function f, which is just something like a convolutional neural net. So the embedding space is represented by a neural network. I take the average per class of these embedding vectors, and that becomes the prototypes of each class. And to get a distribution over the label of a query input, I will look at what is the distance between the embedding of my query input and each prototype. And then I uh, take the negative of that, pass this through a softmax, and that gives me a distribution over the possible labels. And then when I train, I am, will be uh, optimizing the parameters of my embedding function, my neural net, such that I get good predictions of the labels of the queries in my episodes for training. So that's a fairly simple approach. It's very effective. Uh, and another approach that is quite popular that's a bit different is called uh, MAML, or Model Agnostic Meta Learning. So here we're going to take more direct inspiration from the type of machine learning that we do and the type of ways we often do transfer learning from, uh, to new problems from some amount of training data. Specifically, we're going to try to optimize the neural net so that, it, so that it works well when we perform fine tuning on my support set. So that's a very standard method. We train a neural net classifier first on some data, like ImageNet. And then for a new task, we'll take the training data, we'll initialize from that pre-trained model, and then do a few steps of gradient descent on the new training set. MAML is trying to optimize that initialization such that it works well specifically for fine tuning. And uh, the way it does this is that, uh, in the extreme case, which surprisingly works quite well, is that we're going to learn an initial value of my neural net predictor, say a convolutional neural net classifier, such that a single step of gradient descent, based on the loss in the support set, gives me a good distribution over the labels of new examples from the query set. And it might seem surprising that just one step works, but there's actually some theory that suggests that it's, it can be sufficient. That said, depending on the experiment, sometimes we do multiple updates. But conceptually, it's simpler to just think of one. So we're going to train and backprop through this function, which sometimes requires doing uh, gradients of gradients. I'm not going into details, but you can check out the, the uh, literature on, uh, on MAMO. But that's another approach that has been quite effective 
for meta learning a good initialization of a predictor such that when fine tuned on new problems, uh, you get better performance instead of just hoping that it will work well by training normally. And since I uh, last spoke, uh, I think I presented maybe the top four here uh, or discussed, you know, the, the, uh, we were at the state where these were the published methods. And on this benchmark based on ImageNet, that's called Mini ImageNet, so that is using 64 classes from ImageNet for meta training and then about 24 generalizing, and also uses smaller uh, scale versions of the images. We've made a fair amount of progress going from 60 ish performance uh, on five shots, so five shots means five examples per class, to around 80. And so that all looks great. Um, and as you can see here, there's been a lot of different methods being proposed. But when you start peeking into, say, the state of the art, which is this paper I'm referencing here, and which, uh, which is actually a really neat method that they're proposing, when you start looking at the type of ablation studies that these papers are doing, you start realizing actually that a lot of the gap we're seeing with previous work is actually explained not by the method itself, but by just expertise we've gained in training meta learners in general. So for instance, when they do, uh, this is the performance of their uh, full method, and this is the performance where they remove various fairly general tricks like data augmentation, uh, forms of dropout, label smoothing, larger data, which is when you retrain on the joint meta training and meta validation set, which I personally don't like and usually discourage people to do and just keep the, the validation set alone, but some people sometimes do this. Um, you can see that these results in one shot and five shot actually pretty close to say the uh, originally reported results for prototypical network. And not just that, but there's another difference, which is this column here called the backbone. So the backbone is essentially what is the architecture of the neural net behind few shot learning, the convolutional classifier or embedding function. And you can see early research used fairly small number of feature maps and fully convolutional uh, network, whereas the later research uh, started using residual networks, which are more effective architectures. So this gap is potentially also partly explained by just that change. And I don't mean to dismiss uh, this particular set of work. Actually, I really like the method. It's probably state of the art. But I think that we don't know to what extent it actually improves on the original ideas. So I think that's an opportunity maybe to start thinking, okay, well, should we just start again from scratch? And then if we're gonna do that, maybe we should consider a new benchmark than mean image net, which is currently the most popular. And so that's what I wanna discuss. Stuff that we've done in uh, my collaboration is trying to think about should we and, and are there better benchmark for meta learning for the next generation of research. And specifically, I'll talk about two things, uh, two set of works. Uh, the first one, which is about addressing the question, should we find better benchmarks uh, in uh, this work uh, that's led by uh, the student, Gabriel Huang, and my collaborator, Simone Lacoste-Julien. And then, uh, you know, uh, biggest of a spoiler, the answer, according to us, is yes. Uh, and then, you know, what could be a better benchmark? And uh, in this piece of work that I've done in my group at Google and led by this intern, Eleni Trentafilou, uh, uh, we propose a benchmark that we call metadata set that I'll talk about. All right, the first question is, do we need better benchmarks? Or are there things that our current benchmark don't quite capture that we would potentially like a benchmark for few shot learning and meta learning to capture? Um, so specifically, um, one question we could ask to test the value of a benchmark is, when we provide a support set for a new task, are the labels so which category belongs each of the images in the support set? Are they actually useful? So to give you an example as to how maybe they're sometimes not, I'm giving you an example of a potential support set. This is not from ImageNet, but this is instead from uh, Omniglot. Omniglot is a data set of handwritten characters for various alphabets. And for lack of time, I won't give you much time to think about it, but I'll just sort of uh, illustrate that in this support set of only eight examples, if I know there are three classes, and you can kind of guess it, well, you, without even knowing the labels, you can kind of figure out that that's probably one class, uh, that's probably a second class, and uh, that's probably a third class. Now, I don't need those labels. I can really infer it in an unsupervised way from the support set. Uh, but ideally, if someone presents you a problem, you would think that there's value to the actual labels, and there might be different ways that the same support set might be classified depending on the user, depending on, on, on the application. So we tried to investigate whether that is true, whether we act can actually throw out the labels and get most of the same performance. And so we proposed what we call the class semantics consistency criterion, which is looking at the following. 
So ideally what we'd like is to know what is the best possible unsupervised accuracy, so one where we don't use the labels that we could reach for classification, divided by what would be the best possible supervised accuracy, where we are actually using the labels. The reality is that we don't know what is this best possible uh, uh, performance, so we'll try to approximate that. And the way we did it is that for the supervised accuracy, we'll uh, just use the accuracy of a prototypical network that I described before. And then for the unsupervised accuracy, uh, we propose a way of doing, of, of measuring it using what we call the centroid networks. And I don't have time to go over the details, but what a centroid network is, is essentially more or less regular training of a prototypical network. So when we meta train, we actually use the labels. But when we evaluate, we won't use them. And the way we won't use them is that on the support set of these episodes from the meta test set, we will instead do clustering of the support set to get assignation to labels for our support set. And we'll treat those essentially as being the true, the true labels for classifying. Okay. You can go over the, the uh, you can find this work online and, and get the details. But in short, what we're finding is that for OmniGlot and Mini ImageNet, we get surprisingly high accuracy when we ignore the labels. Um, so I focused on Mini ImageNet, but I should say OmniGlot is also a pretty popular benchmark. Uh, and surprisingly, the accuracy with and without the labels, so and specifically looking at the ratio, uh, is really, really high, which means that the unsupervised accuracy is, is surprisingly good for OmniGlot. And for mini image net, I would argue that it's also surprisingly high. So without the labels, I can get for five way five shot 55% accuracy. Uh, whereas with the labels, I get you know not a whole lot more, not even 15% better just from the labels. So giving me a ratio of 80%. So that suggests that there's maybe room for improvement on the difficulty of these tasks that we're generating for meta training and meta evaluation. So this led us to, uh, leads us to our proposal for a new benchmark. Um, and beyond what I've described as a potential issue, there are many others that, that I think we can easily identify. So when we look at the mini image net benchmark, it assumes a fixed number of examples per class, and it assumes a known number of uh, classes for the problem. So you've seen that the results sometimes are reported as five way five shot. Well, when we meta train a model for that, we actually have only episodes that are five way and five shot. And when we report results on one way, uh, sorry, one shot five way, we actually have a different meta learner that's trained only on episodes of one shot five way. So they're actually not the same system being evaluated in, in these numbers. But ideally what we'd like is a meta learner that can actually adjust to any number of ways and any number of, of shots, or at least small number of shots. So one simple thing that we can do moving forward is when we create these episodes is to vary the number of classes per episode or per task, vary the number of examples per task, and also vary the balance of the classes. So how frequent are different classes in the support set of the class. But another thing that we can do also is not take the data for these tasks only from the same and unique original training set or source of data. So for instance, mini ImageNet is only based on ImageNet data. OmniGlot is only based on these handwritten characters. Whereas again, if we want to broaden the applicability of these methods, we really want to cover as many types of classification problems that people are potentially interested in. And so that's how we came up with the idea for a meta data set. Uh, it's it's you know, conceptually pretty simple. What we'll do is that when we generate these tasks, we'll actually take the data from a lot of different original source data sets. Specifically in meta data set, we uh, have 10 different data sets that are used to create task or episode, which is why we call it the meta data set, because it's a data set of data sets. And you are seeing them all here, and you see there's a variability in the, uh, how natural the data is, and written versus natural images, how fine-grained it is, only uh, aircraft versus various types of, of, of objects, uh, how abstract it is, you have these textures, describable textures data set, uh, fungi, you have flowers, Traffic signs, uh, MS Coco da uh, data set actually has some classes that we tried to use. And also we'll actually hold some of these data sets only for testing. That is, we'll have our meta learners not train on any, any images or any classes from those data sets to hopefully provide a, an even better measurement of generalization because these images will have literally been collected separately by different people. Um, so when we generate episodes, what we'll do is that we'll uh, for meta training, say, we will uniformly pick one of these data set source, and then within that data set, 
we uh, usually separate into still into training classes and test classes. So for training, we'll only consider the training classes. We'll take a subset of these, and then we take images from these, and that's how we'll construct a task or an episode. Um, when we did these experiments, we actually found some issues with both MAML and prototypical networks. We found that MAML was having a hard time with variable shot. Um, and uh, also we found prototypical network to work well on the small number of examples, but not that well when we started to increase the number of shots. It didn't seem to scale all that well uh, and not be adaptive enough. So one, uh, one contribution of this work has been to try to find ways of, of merging these two, two ideas, uh, which we call proto-mammal. Uh, I won't go into details, but in a nutshell, we're going to use MAML to train an initialization of a prototypical network that will then be fine-tuned on the support set. Okay? So that, it, it's a fairly straightforward combination, but actually we find it to be quite effective. There's another way of thinking of it as improving MAML by getting a better initialization of the output weights. And you can look at the paper for more details on that interpretation. But when we did our experiments, we compared with both a very regular fine-tuning baseline where we train on all the data jointly found in the training set, and then we just post-hoc do some fine-tuning on the episodes of, uh, in the meta test set. Uh, we compared various known and published meta learners, and we also looked at our combination of prototypical network and MAML, which ends up being most of the time ranked first in our, in our performances. We can also look at, now that we have models that can do a variable number of, talk, uh, of shots, uh, we can look at the performance and how it varies. And one area of improvement for our proto mammal and some meta learning methods is that for a small number of shots, it seems to dominate over baselines. But then with large number of shots, it seems regular fine tuning is working better. So I think there's still research to be done in trying to have a, a method that actually dominates across this axis. So I'll end here. Um, so please go check out Metadata Set if you're interested in doing research in, in meta learning, and specifically if you're shot learning. Uh, there's code online on GitHub at Google Research slash Metadata Set uh, for uh, generating uh, the episodes and, and performing evaluation. And hopefully that's a good next step for us to move forward in, in, in this problem. Thank you.